I'm excited to be back in the book of Acts. I have fallen head over heels in love with the book. And I have learned things out of the book of Acts that are not only transformational to our church, but it's been transformational for my personal life. It has changed the way that I pray. It's changed the way that I view church. It's changed the way that I do church. The book of Acts has just transformed my thinking in so many different ways, and I hope it's done the same for you. There have been some people who have come back to our church after being here a while, uh, you know, some years ago, whatever the case, and they've come back during this season that we've been in the book of Acts, and they, they have come up to me and said, Chad, what's happened? It's a totally different church. I don't remember it being this way. What happened? And I can tell you what happened. Prayer is what happened. But where did we learn it? Out of the book of Acts. Going back to what the early church did. I'm not against strategies, and I'm not against methods, and I'm not against those things that are uh, needed and necessary for churches and organizations to grow. But let me tell you, that's not where the power of God lies. The power of God lies in prayer. And the book of Acts teaches us those principles. They had no buildings. They had no political clout. They didn't have any financing. They didn't have the backing of, 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 of wealthy things. Uh, they didn't even have buildings to gather in. They gathered in homes. But yet they absolutely transformed their culture. Now, what is wrong with the church today that we have buildings literally on every corner, do we not? You can throw a rock and hit a church in this town, right? They're everywhere. So why is it that we have the latest technology and we have the most comfortable seating and we have slick lights and we have great music and we have all of these things that you would think in your mind would be necessary to building a church? But are we changing culture the way we should be? Not the way it should be. Not the way that I think God is going to lead us to do, right? And where is that going to be found? It's going to be going back to the basics, back to the principles that we learn out of the book of Acts. And you can hear my baby amening me, right? He's going, amen, dad, amen, <laughs> or something like that. Okay, Acts chapter 21. Now, we're going to pick up, this is actually where we picked up in the last section of the book, and you remember we were going to conclude on mission with this last sermon in the book of Acts, and you remember the Holy Spirit fell so heavy that last Sunday, I believe that was back in May, and the Holy Spirit fell so heavy, all we could do is pray. <laughs> you remember that Sunday? Wasn't that a glorious Sunday? That was when Jim and Curtis Money Hun were with us, and they, they did some special things that day. But, oh, goodness, the presence of the Lord was so thick in here. You know, yesterday, just so you know, I was here at the church. I had so much to do yesterday. Uh, my plate was so full. I just, there was no way. I had 20 things I had, to, I had to get done yesterday. And I was so busy, but I could feel the Lord drawing me to prayer. I could feel the Lord saying, no, 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 no. You're too busy, Chad, not to pray. Still away. Come on. Come on. And I entered into some prayer times. Oh, I tell you, me and the Lord had the best time yesterday just, just in prayer. And I was praying and I was seeking the Lord. And, and I tell you, I just tell you, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. The Lord said, there's going to be a cloud of glory over your church. It's just, I, I, I can feel it with everything in my core. It was such a holy moment with the Lord. It was such a humbling moment with the Lord. And let me just tell you, that I'm just being led by the Holy Spirit right now. Is that okay with you? I haven't even read the text yet, but I just got to tell you what's in my heart. The last couple of years, we have had a assault of the enemy at the end of October, the 1st of November, it's been on time, on schedule the last two years. The end of October, the 1st of November, me and the staff have been talking about it. And we're, and we're praying about this thing. But let me tell you what connection I didn't make until last week. So, 
you know, it, it's come like clockwork the last two years, and we're kind of bracing ourselves this year, and we're praying against this. But uh, I forgot what the Lord had told me. Some years ago, this probably was in 05 or 06, maybe 07. I can't remember the year at the moment, but it was around that time frame. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in the summer months, and he said, Chad, uh, very clearly, I heard, I heard him so clearly, he said, the months of October, November, and December are going to be months of an open heaven over your church. Oh, I heard him so clearly. An open heaven. An open heaven. And so, you know, I began to prepare my heart for that. And October and November and December came and went. And there was nothing different. January... I, I was almost like, I mean, I can remember just a spiritual heaviness. I'm like, Lord, how did I miss it? You said you're going to do this, and I believe you're going to do this, but nothing happened. Lord, what did I do wrong? How did I miss your timing? How did I miss your will? Show me what I did wrong. And here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. <laughs> he said, I never told you what year. He said, there's going to be an open heaven the months of October, November, and December. Well, I'm not, I'm not that smart sometimes. It takes me a long time to clue in. And then I realized, I realized yesterday, why does Satan fight us the last two years? Why has he fought so fiercely the end of October? The, I think because he knows what God is going to do. Amen? <laughs> he knows he knows. He knows what God is going to do. So I think we need to push into this and begin to pray fervently that God is going to send His glory October, November. Open heaven. Open heaven. Amen? Well, I, don't even, I can't see the clock back there. I think I'm running out of time. So let's get into the text. Is it 934? Oh, 930. Oh, praise God. I've got 30 minutes. Well, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to do whatever the Lord says. Amen? And if people come in while we're praying, they can come in and have a seat. Right? We're not on no time schedule. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray. We're praying for that. We're praying for that. Not, we're praying for the 11 a.m. group, aren't we? We're here to pray. We're not going to worry about time. Acts chapter 21. Amen. Acts chapter 21. We're going to begin with verse number 1. Now remember, Acts is a narrative. We're walking through the story. Luke writes so well, he helps us see with our mind's eye. He helps us see where they are and what's happening. He's such a writer. And let's, let's go as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. <coughs> Excuse me. And when he had parted from them and set sail, speaking of Paul, we came by a straight course to cause. Sorry, I'm going to have to bring this a little closer. And the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. Then we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left. See, he's telling us exactly where they are. We sailed to Syria and landed in Tyre. And there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. Apparently this was quite a large ship. Because <clears throat> if it took seven days to unload its cargo... You can imagine its size. And it would have been a large ship to have been able to handle the storms upon the Mediterranean. So now, listen closely to what Luke says. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now that's an important phrase. Through the Spirit. This is not a hunch. This is not, uh, you know, we have an intuition or we have a bad feeling, Paul. This is being directed through the Spirit. Now today we're going to ask the question, is it ever right to ignore good advice? Now, not only am I a pastor, but a big part of my pastoral responsibilities is I'm also a counselor. I've done over 100 counseling sessions already this year. 
And nothing is more discouraging to a counselor than to tell someone what to do, to give them good and godly advice and for them to ignore it. Is it ever right to ignore good advice? So here Paul is. They're telling him through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. This is more than a hunch, more than an intuition. This is through the Holy Spirit. Verse number 5, when our days there were ended, <clears throat> we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we were... I'm sorry, we arrived at Ptolemais and was greeted. I'm sorry, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Now that's massive, don't miss that. Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven. And stayed with him. And he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. We were staying for many days. A prophet, <clears throat> while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul. He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his hands. And said, thus says again, the Holy Spirit. Note that. Thus says the Holy Spirit. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, and, and the people there, I apologize, I'm having a difficult time today seeing they urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And when Paul answered them, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only, for I'm ready not only uh, to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, listen to this, we ceased. And said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. Bringing us to the house of uh, Manasseh of Cyprus. Uh, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Very interesting portions of scripture. What would the Lord say to us today out of this? Now Paul is determined. Paul said in one portion, I must see Rome. Now, there are some commentators, some scholars, who actually think that Paul made the worst mistake of his entire life in these following verses. Here, the disciples told him not to go through the Spirit, told him not to go to Jerusalem. And then they enter the house of Philippi, which is quite significant because you remember the Old Testament story of Jacob and Esau <coughs> Where Jacob, I'll pray for me, I'm struggling this morning. <clears throat> Jacob and Esau, and you remember that God made Jacob go back and face his brother. Do you remember that? And how, how nervous Jacob was because he had to face his old rival. Well, if you remember in our preaching in the book of Acts in the earlier chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5 through there, you remember uh, later on, Four is where the persecution came. And then six is where Paul comes on the scene. And they're stoning Stephen, who was one of the seven, who was one of the deacons. And then do you remember when we get to chapter 8? Do you remember that? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Do you remember chapter 8? Chapter 8 is where we are introduced to an evangelist named Philip. And who was Philip? He was one of the four. He's one of these deacons. And he's driven out of Jerusalem because of who? The Apostle Paul. Or Saul, as he was known then. The Bible says that he held the coats 
of the men. Saul held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen. He was there, he was present, and he approved it. And then Philip was driven out of Jerusalem. He went down into Samaria, being led by the Holy Spirit, and he led many of the Samaritans to Christ. Well, then the Bible tells us the Lord led him to a wilderness, (coughs) and then Philip vanishes from the pages of the book of Acts. And we don't meet him again until we come right here to chapter 21. And I wonder if just like Jacob and Esau and how Jacob kind of, you know, he dreaded meeting Esau again. How did Paul feel walking into Philip's home? Paul, who was Saul, who persecuted the church and who persecuted Philip and drove him out of Jerusalem. And now the Holy Spirit leads Paul back to Philip and he's going to lodge in his home. Do you think that was a little awkward for Paul? Do you think it was a little difficult? Maybe, but you know, Paul's the one who the Holy Spirit led to write Romans 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? See, when Paul wrote that, he wasn't just writing that to other people. I think Paul felt that very deeply. Because now Paul, who once persecuted the church, now he is being persecuted. But he had to have felt some guilt. He had to have had some pretty bad nightmares. He had to have had some human difficulty and struggling with his past. That's why he says so effectively, forgetting those things which are behind me. So Paul, we see... Now he's getting ready to go back to the house of Philip, who he once persecuted, who he drove out of the city of Jerusalem, and he's going to lodge with him. And now here we are at Philip's house. He has four unmarried daughters, and they prophesy. Now what's that mean, they prophesy? Don't don't think that's something odd or something weird. Some people have an idea of prophesying as... You know, it's this mystical person who somehow sees the future. And, uh, you know, like Agabus here, I I have in my mind's eye what Agabus looked like. You know what I mean? I mean, I picture him like, you know, do I really want to be around him? Because he's going to read my thinking, right? He's going to tell me, you know. No, no, it's it's not something mystical. People, you know, there are some people who have the gift of prophesying. God, God shares with them things. God will tell them. And then, you know, many of us, If you're sensitive and if you're led by the Holy Spirit, God will use you to prophesy. And does that mean you stand up and say, you know, thus saith the Holy Spirit, the Lord's going to strike thee? And No, no, no. It may be in a simple conversation with someone and God begins to show you that God's going to do something for them or God's leading them somehow. It's not anything weird. Do you know what happened this Tuesday night? Let, Let me tell you. This Tuesday night was such a special prayer night, and uh, a family was sitting over here, Tuesday night prayer, and they drove for Morrisburg, I think that's where they, is that where they're from? I'm talking like Morristown. They drove all the way from basically Morristown to come to prayer meeting. And I had never met them, and I didn't know who they were, and they're sitting over here. We have some time of prayer up here, and the Lord, the presence of the Lord was so sweet. And Pat Fry, who is sitting over here on the second row, I'm getting ready to transition everything. We just got through praying. Everyone went back to their seats. I'm literally standing right here, and I'm getting ready to say, okay, now we're going to. And she stands up. And if you know Pat, she's as quiet as a mouse. And she stands up, and she says, I have got to obey the Holy Spirit. I've never seen her do anything like that. And she said, I have to obey the Holy Spirit. She said, that woman. And she pointed like that across the room. It took me by surprise. She pointed. I went, huh? And she said, that woman. She didn't know who she was. Didn't know her name. And she said, that woman. God has something for her tonight. God has a word for her. God's opening doors for her. Well, how do you think I felt? You know, I'm such a structured person. I like everything in its proper place. The first thing I thought is, that's a visitor. (laughs) They're never coming back. Shh. Tell that to Johnny. 
Don't tell it to her. <laughs> I'm kidding. She pointed and she said what the Holy Spirit gave her to say. And that woman broke. She came up here for prayer. Oh, it was so sweet. I mean, it was such confirmation. That's what that lady needed. That's prophesying. It wasn't weird. It wasn't fanatical. It wasn't mystical. She just spoke. That's what prophesying is. It's speaking what God gives you to speak. I've had many people prophesy to me, and they didn't even know it. I had a man coming up to me one time many years ago. I was very young, and the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord said, I want you to start your church, and I want you to do it now. And I was scared out of my head. I said, oh, no, God, I can't do that. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And God kept saying, this is my will. I want you to do this. And a man walks up to me. A man walks up to me. He did. He don't even know what prophesying is. And he walked up. And tears were in his eyes. And he said, Chad, I had a dream about you last night. And this is what I dreamed. He said, I saw you behind this pulpit. In this church. And he said it was your church. You were the pastor of it. And he began to go into great detail about what he saw. And the whole time the Holy Spirit's saying, see I told you. I told you now. What was he doing? He's prophesying. He was telling me the word of the Lord. It's not weird. It's not mystical. Every one of us should begin to pray. Lord help me to prophesy to others. Help me to be able to share your heart with others. Listen, go back on our app and listen to... Uh, one of the last prayer meetings where Joy Bollinger spoke and how God on a number of occasions directed her to someone, uh, you know, working, we're just working a job, a server or someone working at Dunkin' Donuts, if I recall, and how God directed her and said, say this to this person. That's prophesying. Say this. Go here. Say this. That's just being led by the Spirit of God. Amen. And, and, and if we're not careful what, what the church today have done, we've traded, we've traded these experiences with God with just coming to church and listening to a sermon. And although that's important, and although it certainly has its place, God does not measure His kingdom by church attendance or church services. It's out there, amen? And we ought to leave saying, God, give me a word for people out there. Standing in line at... Walmart or Target or whatever, God may give you a word for the cashier. Going, going, you know, going to a, a, a ball game or going to, you know, wherever you drink coffee or whatever, God may give you a word for the person checking you out. Whatever. You be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Susan Bishop was sharing with me, there was this young girl walking on the road a couple of weeks ago. God told her to pull over. And began to talk to that young girl. And boy, she, oh goodness, great. That young girl came here a few weeks ago and shared her testimony. Because she was led by the Holy Spirit to talk to someone, to invest in someone. Amen? Prophesying. That's, that's all that is. So he has four unmarried daughters. They're prophesying. And then, and then a prophet who is mentioned quite a number of times in the book of Acts, Agabus, comes 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 to see Paul. And Agabus takes Paul's belt and he binds his own hands and his own feet and he says, thus saith the Holy Spirit, this is what will happen if you go to Jerusalem. Now this is... Hmm. Nine times out of ten, you would not tell someone to ignore good advice. Now, did Paul mess up? Was he... Was he um, was he going against God's will? No, not at all. And I can prove that because we're going to get there in a couple of weeks. When Paul goes to Jerusalem, indeed, he is arrested. Before this, <coughs> if you remember in chapter 20, the Holy Spirit told Paul, Paul said, through many trials, through many tears, we are entering the kingdom of God. And this is what he said in chapter 20. The Holy Spirit told him that in every city awaited imprisonment and affliction. I don't believe that this was a word of restriction to Paul. I think it was a word of confirmation. Paul knew what he needed to do. 
He needed to go to Jerusalem, and the Lord was going to send him to Rome. So did Paul ignore good advice? Well, this is, I think, the takeaway for today. Good advice is not always the right advice. You must determine what the will of the Lord is. And even though these people who loved Paul, and they urged him, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to... The Holy Spirit is showing us, don't do this. Paul had to discern for his own life, for his own ministry, what God's will was. And when the others said, Paul cannot be persuaded. <laughs> it's like talking to a brick wall. They said, well, let the will of the Lord be done. Now see, some scholars read that and they go, Paul refused good advice. He went against God's will. I don't believe that. And let me tell you why. We'll get to it in a few weeks. Paul goes to Jerusalem. Indeed, he is imprisoned. Indeed, they say they are going to kill him. And you know what happens to Paul in the prison, in the prison cell in Jerusalem? The Lord Jesus appears to him. The Lord comes to Paul. Can you imagine what Satan was saying to him? Paul, you should have, ne you should have listened to Agabus. You should have listened to those four unmarried girls. You should have listened to the brothers at Tyree. You should have listened, Paul. You failed. You've messed up. You've burned bridges. When they find out you're in prison, they're going to be angry at you. You've messed up. You've missed God's will. But the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And the Lord told him, Paul, I'm with you. And he encouraged him. And he said, you must go to Rome. He was on track. He was on schedule. He was fulfilling not only what the Holy Spirit said to him in chapter 20, that in every city, imprisonment awaits, affliction awaits. But now, he's here in chapter, I think it's chapter 22, chapter 23. The Lord comes to him and says, Paul, you're right on schedule. So there may be things in your life that you're questioning today. Decisions that you feel like God told you to do. You may have went directions that you feel like God really led you in, but things didn't turn out right. <laughs> or at least in your mind, they didn't turn out right. Or maybe in people who love you, they're over here saying, See, I told you, you should have never done that. See, I told you, you were getting off track. See, I told you, I would have prayed more about that. You missed it somehow. That don't necessarily mean you missed it. Good advice is not always the right advice. Nine times out of ten, it is. But not when it's against the will of the Lord. So my question today, especially out of chapter 21, is are you following the will of the Lord? Not what other people think is the will of the Lord. What you know the will of the Lord is for you. And sometimes that will is going to lead you in very difficult circumstances, Sometimes it's going to lead you in seasons of affliction. Sometimes it's going to lead you in seasons that you are thinking, what in the world? If I, was, if I was where I needed to be with the Lord, I would not be going through this. Don't you dare think that. Because I guarantee you that's what Satan was saying to Paul. If you were even half the man that you and others think you are, you wouldn't be in prison in Jerusalem. People tried to tell you, Paul. People tried to warn you, Paul. People tried to tell you not to do this. You failed. You were stubborn. You ignored. No, no, no. Paul didn't fall for that. The Lord came through and the Lord encouraged him. What is it that God's told you to do that maybe, perhaps, it feels like it's backfired? No, you keep trusting the Lord. Lastly, today, there may be some areas of reconciliation that you need to make with others. Maybe like Paul, you're not today who you once were. And maybe there needs to be some reconciliation with others. I would imagine, oh, I really wish, I really wish that Luke would have included this, but it wasn't the will of the Holy Spirit. I think that's, that's what I'm looking forward to about heaven is I'm hoping that I'll remember all my questions and that's going to take up a century or two. And so I can sit down with Paul and Philip and I can say, guys, what was your conversation like? What was the first thing you said to Philip, Paul? 
I mean, did he rehearse in his head what he was going to say? I mean, we know the Paul then was not the Saul before, right? We, we know there was a change, but what did, I mean, did he shake his hand or did he hug him? Did he say, brother, I'm so sorry? I don't know. It's not recorded. But I'm going to ask one day. There may be some reconciliation that you need to make with some people from your past. And maybe you need to go to them and say, listen, I'm not today who I was back then. And I owe you a great apology. There's nothing wrong with that. A brother in our church was sharing with me this week that his ex-wife, long before they were ever Christians, his ex-wife, and they just had a grandbaby. And this brother was telling me that for the first time, since decades, they sat in a room together alone. And he said, it gave me the opportunity to tell her, I'm sorry, I was not a good husband. I didn't know the Lord. What an opportunity. And I asked him, I said, how was it received? And he said she was so appreciative. Amen. Listen, there are times that you're going to need to reconcile the past. And I think Paul did this. And he stayed with Philip, who he personally persecuted. Now, I don't know what your past is or who you need to reconcile with, but I bet it's not that bad. <laughs> if Paul did it, you can do it. Let's make reconciliation. Let's follow the will of the Lord. Even if the people who love us disagree with us, let's do what we know in our heart the Lord is telling us to do. And in the end, just like with Paul, the Lord will stand by us and he'll encourage us and he'll help us. Amen. Let's bow our heads today. Lord, I thank you for Acts 21. The entire book is so special and Acts 21 does not fail in being special to me. I don't know what you need to do in our lives personally this morning. But I know for me, Lord, I want to follow the will of God. I want to follow that. And not everyone is going to understand, and that's okay. It's my responsibility to understand. And other people didn't understand Paul. They didn't understand why he would go against what seemed to be what the Holy Spirit was saying. But again, Lord... Uh, my interpretation, I don't believe this was a restriction of the Holy Spirit. I think it was a confirmation, uh, a warning, but not a restriction. Not a restriction. So God, give us the courage, like Paul, to do what you tell us to do. And give us the grace to reconcile with things in our past that we need to reconcile. Because whether it has been decades, or whether it's been five years, or whether it was last month, we're not the people now that we were. Because every day we're conforming, we're, we're transforming more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. So help us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I love you so much. Thank you for being here on this first 9 a.m. service. Amen? The first one. And one